So I'm told that early this morning, the closing ceremonies of the Olympics happened. And I, for one, am actually kind of glad that the Olympics are over because I have been staying up way too late to watch Olympic sports happen, sports that I don't even really care about the rest of the time, but suddenly am very invested in. For example, this past Wednesday night, I stayed up way too late watching our Canadian women's hockey team lose the gold medal for the very first time in 20 years. And I kept on telling myself, just go to bed. But I was sucked into the game and I stayed right till the bitter end and I paid for it the next day. And uh, it was a nail biter of a game and we all know why they lost, the refs. <laughs> it's true. They sort of made up for it by calling a penalty against the US in overtime. But up until then, they were pretty much trying to control the game. Everybody, I mean, even the commentators were trying to be polite about it, but they were blaming them too. But I've watched enough Olympics over the last little while and listened to the commentary that I feel like I'm now able to offer you my expert commentary on what went down in that game. And there's another reason that we lost. It wasn't just the refs. It was also because I didn't cheer hard enough. Because I was, I was arrogant, quite frankly. I was like, we've won this every time. Like, we haven't lost in 20 years. We will win the gold medal. It's kind of, it's just the way it is, especially when we play the U.S. We rise up to the occasion. So I didn't, like, wear my Canadian paraphernalia. I didn't put on my Canada shirt. I didn't, I mean, I cheered, but I wasn't as invested in the game. Even when they tied it up and we went into overtime, I was kind of like, we've been here before. Um, I got, you know, we're fine. Uh, so I, I was a little, my arrogance led to complacence. And uh, you might not think that my cheering made any difference in the game, but we not only went into overtime, we went through five rounds of shootouts and then into sudden death shootouts. So just a little bit of difference could have been the difference in the game, and it could have been me. I'm willing to acknowledge that. And I have further proof. Uh, I didn't even get out of bed to watch the Canadian men play the German team, and look what happened there. We lost. So it's my fault. I, I'm willing to acknowledge that, again, because I was complacent. We see this all the time in sport, right? We, it's why our favorite team can, can play really, really well against the best team in the league and struggle really hard against the weakest team in the league. It's because of arrogance. We got this. We don't even have to prepare. And it slips into complacency. We barely even have to show up. We're just going to win. We see it in history. Uh, Napoleon, when he invaded Russia, he was so confident that, that he could win within a matter of a couple battles that, and, and force the surrender of the Russian forces that, that he didn't prepare for sustained battle. He was arrogant, and it led to complacency, and he didn't prepare for sustained war. Same thing happened to Hitler in 1941 when he went into Russia. It's even worse because he should have learned from Napoleon's example, but apparently he was so arrogant, he was just like, I'm better than him. I've got a better plan. This is going to work out in my favor. And the same thing happened, slipped into complacency, didn't prepare for the contingencies, got bogged down there. It's the same attitude, maybe not on the same scale, hopefully, that keeps us from having emergency preparedness kits in our vehicles or in our homes. It's not going to happen to me. I'm a good driver. I don't travel that far, whatever it is. Arrogance, complacency. And it's the same attitude of arrogance and superiority, this attitude of complacency, that Paul's addressing here in Romans 11. Now, I acknowledge we are in a difficult chapter in a difficult section of a difficult letter. In fact, when I went home a couple of weeks ago after preaching at church at 6, doing Romans 9, uh, I saw, as I was scrolling through Facebook just to relax, my professor from McMaster had posted this meme on her wall and I could relate. Yeah. Start, everything's fine, get nine chapters in and you're pulling your hair out. I'd like to see what that guy looks like in chapter 11 because it's difficult. Now. I'm not going to address all of the controversies and the difficulties in the passage. Uh, maybe we'll get to some of that in Q&A, and so if you have some questions, I encourage you to text them in, and, and we'll uh, try to explore a few of them towards the end of the sermon. Because I think it's really important for us to keep the big picture in mind as we look at Romans 11. We need to remember that Paul is writing to a particular group of people in a particular time. He's writing to followers of Jesus who are living in Rome a few decades after Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension. And he's writing to address a particular situation. He wants them to understand how the gospel invites them into a unified faith-based 
faced multi-ethnic family through Jesus Christ. He recognizes that there is tension in the church between Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians who have different beliefs about how their Christianity should be expressed. And he wants them to understand that the gospel, the good news means that they are all part of the same family. And in this family, there is no room for arrogance and there is no room for complacency. And the first reason there's no room for arrogance, he says, is because we have been chosen by grace. We see this in verse 5 of our passage. He says this, So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. And if by grace, then it cannot be based on works. If it were, grace would no longer be grace. This has been drummed into me from an early age, from Sunday school. I can remember memorizing another, uh, from another letter that Paul wrote to another church, for Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. It is by grace you have been saved through faith, not by works, so that no one can boast. This is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Right? You, don't, you don't earn it. You don't earn your way into God's family. There's no point system. There is no sticker chart on the fridge. You just get it by grace. It's a gift of God. And so what Paul's saying in this passage is, don't be arrogant. You have been chosen by grace. Now, if you're like me and you've grown up in the church or you've been with us for a little while, you probably get that it's not by works, that we don't get into the family through works. But the amazing thing is, as I was reflecting on this uh, this week, is that we still find things to be arrogant about in God's family. You see, I get that, that I don't get into God's family by doing the right things, but I'm tempted to believe that I get into God's family by believing the right things, which can lead to arrogance because I believe better or deeper or more fully than you do. Last week, Dave, Dave talked about the different presentations of the gospel that he's kind of experienced in his lifetime. And even these different presentations can be a reason for arrogance. Well, I can't believe that you're still using the four spiritual laws and the bridge diagram. I believe in a much more full expression, a more sophisticated expression of the gospel. And we look down on other people. We look down on others because their views are too progressive or too narrow. We look down on others because they went to the wrong Bible college or DTS or whatever name it was given where you went or because they didn't go to Bible college or DTS at all. We look down on others because they read the wrong authors and listen to the wrong preachers or teachers. We look down on others because they read books and I read blogs and they listen to the radio and I listen to podcasts, much more progressive or vice versa. Whatever you think separates you from those around you. Whatever you think makes you better than the other members of the family, Paul reminds us all that we have nothing to be arrogant about. Over and over again in this letter, he says there is no difference. In his context, there is no difference between the Jew and the Gentile. But I think we could just leave it at that. There is no difference. We were all disobedient. We were all enslaved by sin. We were all subject to death. We all fall short of God's glory. We're all incapable of fulfilling God's plan for us and for his world. And we are all justified freely by grace. By grace. It's a gift. All you did was receive it. There's nothing to be arrogant about. Now I can understand that this can be a stumbling block. We talked about that in Romans 9 as well. We want to think we've earned our way somehow or we deserve our way somehow. I've learned something about myself over the years. I've learned that I am terrible at receiving gifts, especially unexpected gifts, surprise gifts. I can remember quite a few years ago, I was the youth pastor in our senior high ministry, and we had incorporated this, this segment in our ministry, this character that we called Dreamweaver. And Dreamweaver, uh, what we did is we solicited some dreams from some of the, from the, some of the kids, the youth in our ministry, uh, things like, uh, I, want, I wish that we could have Slurpees for our whole small group during small group time, or something like that. And periodically, through the year, Dreamweaver would come and grant these dreams and wishes. And I remember one particular time that uh, Dreamweaver was not scheduled to appear, and yet I could see Dreamweaver flitting around the edges of our youth ministry. And I, 
we were behind, the game had gone long, uh, chapel was scheduled, I wanted to make sure there was enough time for small groups, and I wondered what was going on, and I started, like, Dreamweaver's not supposed to be here, and somebody told me, don't worry about it, it's going to be okay, and that may, that's not a nice thing to say to somebody who's worried, uh, that doesn't help. So I just got angry, and then, but I was like, okay, I'm just going to go with it. And also I started to figure out that something might be going on. And sure enough, just before I got up to speak at youth that night, Dreamweaver came onto the stage, and I discovered that my volunteer youth staff had pooled their money together and bought my wife and I a brand new television. And they brought it out. And I responded terribly. I left it in the box, pushed it to the back of the stage, and continued on with the rest of the night. And for like years now, I've wondered, like, why did I do that? That was so bad. And, and maybe it was because it was unexpected. I wasn't expecting it. Maybe it was because it was undeserved. I definitely didn't deserve a new television, especially given my attitude in that moment. Maybe it was because it completely interrupted my plan. And that's the thing about grace, though, isn't it? By definition, it's undeserved. It almost always is unexpected. And it usually disrupts our plans. My wife responded so much better. She was away at a meeting. She came back. The youth staff told her what, what they had done. She was like over the moon. She was ecstatic and enthusiastic. She ripped open that box to see the television. She hugged people. She reminded me that this was an expression of love from my youth staff. This is an expression of love from God. He's offering you a gift today. He's inviting you to become his son, to become his daughter, to take your place at his table. Not because you earned it, not because you deserved it, not because you are good enough or smart enough or because lots of people like you. It's not even because of any potential that he sees in you necessarily. It's simply because he loves you. He loves you. It's a gift. Don't be like me. Don't leave it in the box and shove it to the corner of your life and just get on with your plan. Receive it. Delight in it. Let it disrupt your plans. There's a danger if we forget that we're chosen by grace. And that danger is arrogance. It's also complacency. And this is Paul's second warning to the people in Romans, uh, in Rome. He says this in verse 17. If some of the branches have been broken off, now let me just pause here because he's introducing a new image just kind of suddenly. He, he introduces it at the end of verse 16. And he's picking up on, on some Old Testament imagery where, where the nation of Israel was seen as this olive tree. And the individual branches were the individuals in the olive tree. And so he's saying some of the branches have been broken off. And you, though a wild olive shoot from a completely different tree, don't belong to this family, don't belong to this tree, you have been grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing sap from the olive root. Do not consider yourself to be superior to those other branches, the ones that have been broken off. If you do, consider this. You do not support the root, but the root supports you. Again, don't be arrogant. You do not support the root. The root doesn't, the root doesn't need you. The, the root supports you. You need the root. And I'm not an expert in this field, but, but I understand that wild branches were not grafted into cultivated trees. This is a surprising gift of grace, completely unexpected. So don't be arrogant about it. Last week, Pastor Dave introduced us to the gospel in 30 words, which comes from Bruxy Cavey's book, Reunion. And it says this, this is the 30 words. Jesus is God with us. Come to show us God's love, save us from sin, set up God's kingdom, and shut down religion. And we cannot forget this last part. So we can share in God's life. So we can share in God's life. And really, this is the image that Paul has in mind in these verses, that, that we are supported by the root. And as we're supported by the root, the life of God, the, the nourishing sap from the olive tree flows through us. And there's a warning implied in this as well. 
The way that you know that an olive branch is healthy, the way that you know that an olive branch is connected to the root and receiving nourishing sap is to look at the branch and see if it has olives on it. The implication of the image is that the way that that you can know that you are connected to the life of God, that you're sharing in the life of God, is to look at your life and see if you're bearing fruit. And really, fruit in in the New Testament is is two things that we tend to separate, but probably the New Testament keeps really close together. First of all, fruit is reflecting the character of Jesus in your life. That more and more, as the Spirit fills you and empowers you and shapes you, you will look like Jesus. You will have the heart of Jesus. And secondly, you will make disciples. Disciples. So Paul's argument is, don't be arrogant. You were chosen by grace. It's a gift. You didn't earn it. You didn't deserve it. You just received it. And secondly, don't be complacent. You were chosen with a purpose. Now Paul weaves this argument so tightly all throughout the passage, it's kind of hard to pull out specific verses to to show it. But essentially, if you read the passage, the logical flow goes like this. Israel was chosen by God to display God's glory and draw others into God's family, into his family tree. And in part, God's blessing on Israel was supposed to make the Gentiles jealous and attract them to submit to their part in God's plan and to bring God glory. But Israel failed to bring God glory. They, they thought the plan was all about them. They rejected their role in God's plan. They grew arrogant. They believed that they were, they were God's special chosen people, which they were, but simply because they were special. They, they didn't think that there was any purpose to this plan or they forgot the purpose of the plan. And, and at some point, they even grew so hard that they resisted sharing God's blessing or his glory with other people. They tried to keep them out. It was all for them. But Israel's rejection of God's plan doesn't stop God from fulfilling his plan. He stays faithful to his purpose for all of humanity. He stays faithful to his promises that he makes to Abraham. And he stays faithful to his plan through Jesus. And now, through Jesus, all of humanity, all of us, are invited into the faith-based multi-ethnic family of Abraham. We're all brought in to his family into his tree, to use Paul's image. And the inclusion of all of humanity, Paul argues, is to make Israel jealous so that they will be attracted to to God and to reconsider their rejection of God's plan. So he says, don't be arrogant and don't be complacent. He anticipates the argument, the counter-argument in verse 19. He says, well, you'll say then, but branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in. In other words, you might start to adopt the, the attitude of Israel. Well, if God got rid of those people to bring me in, it must be because he saw something in me that he really valued or wanted, that my place in his plan and his family must be pretty secure if he was willing to go to that length. I'm God's chosen. Nothing's ever going to change that. Verse 20, he says, Granted, Good argument. But they were broken off because of unbelief, and you stand by faith. Don't be arrogant, but tremble. In other words, learn from Israel's example. Learn from their history. Israel didn't believe that God, God's plan included the blessing of all people through Jesus, and so they refused to submit to his plan and the only reason that you now stand, the only reason that you're drawing the sap from the, from the root is because you believe that God's plan is to include all of humanity into his family. And you have submitted to your role in his plan. You're willing to allow him to use you for his purpose. So be careful. Don't grow arrogant. Don't be complacent. Don't be presumptuous. Now, I also want to be careful this morning. It's important to recognize that we as branches do not produce life. We as branches cannot produce fruit. The root supports us. We don't support the root. So we are only alive. We're only able to produce fruit or bear fruit because we now share in the nourishing sap of the root. We now share in the life of God. You see, Paul is absolutely convinced 
that the only way for you to reflect the character of Jesus and to truly make disciples is for you to be intimately and essentially connected to the life of Jesus through the Spirit. On the flip side, he is absolutely convinced that if you're truly sharing in the life of Jesus, if you're intimately and essentially connected to that life through the Spirit, then you will reflect Jesus' character and you will make disciples. And the way that we share in the life of Jesus, the way that we connect to the life of Jesus is through faith. Pastor Dave reminded us of this last week. He said, it's faith that Jesus has been raised from the dead and that he is Lord. It's this wholehearted trust in Jesus. It's following Jesus. How do we follow Jesus? How do I do that? Now, remember when you learned how to walk? The answer is no, probably not, because I don't. But based on my observations of other children learning how to walk, it probably went something like this. You took a step. And then when you got over the shock of taking that first step, you took another step. And you probably fell, and you got up, and you took another step, and one step at a time. I think sometimes when we think about following Jesus, we're like, we got to know the whole path. And he's just saying, take a step. Just take a step. And maybe for you here today, the first step of following Jesus is actually just to talk to somebody. You've been thinking about it for a while, and you know somebody who loves you and who loves Jesus and is following Jesus, and your first step is just to ask them, hey, I'm interested in following Jesus. How would I do that? Or if you don't have anybody to talk to, you can come and talk to me after the service. I would love to talk to you about that. Or any of our staff would love to talk to you about that. Or put it on a connection card and we'll be happy to follow up with you later this week. Now, what if you're here this morning and you think that you are following Jesus, you've committed your life to him, you've been trying to follow him, and you look at your life and you're kind of like, no fruit. There's no difference. I, I'm... I don't see a real change in my character, my behavior, my attitudes. I don't see anybody who's come to faith in Christ, any disciples of Christ because of my life or my witness. What about then? And I would say to you, just be patient. Just be patient. Let God do his work through you. It might not be as fast as we would like it to be. It might not be in the way that we would like it to be. But just be patient and continue to trust God. Continue to connect to his life that flows through Jesus and the Spirit. In fact, this is the call of Jesus to us and to his early disciples is, follow me, take that step, and I will make you. I will transform you. I will empower you. I will teach you, I'll equip you, I will send you, I will do it. Just trust me. Now some of you may be here and you're thinking, I've been doing that for a while. How patient do I have to be? I look at my life, I don't see any change in my character, or I don't see anybody who's come to faith in Christ. Even the people closest to me are rejecting Christ right now. Your desire is to follow Jesus. Your desire is to be used in his kingdom, but you just don't see any results from that. Continue to trust. Reach out to us. This is what we are about as a church. If your desire is to follow Jesus and to bear fruit for his kingdom, we would love to journey with you. You don't have to do this on your own. Your community group leaders, your ministry leaders, staff would love to talk with you and work with you and support you through this journey. So come and talk to us. Just don't settle for status quo. Don't grow complacent. You were chosen with a purpose. According to Paul, the proper response to God's amazing plan to fulfill his purposes for creation and keep his promises to Abraham and to deal with, with the power of sin and death in the world is to worship. It's just to worship. God's plan is complex. At times, it's even com confusing. It's hard to understand. And Paul would definitely agree with you. This complex chapter in a complex section of a complex letter reflects the complexity of God's plan. But here's, here's what Paul would say to you. 
You don't have to understand the full dimensions of his plan before you submit to it. In fact, it's arrogance, it's conceit that makes us think that we can understand God's plan or that we need to understand God's plan as if we need to approve of his plan before we submit to him. Yes, his plan is complex. Yes, it's confusing, it's hard to understand, but we can trust that his plan is good because we can trust that he is good. And when we realize that God is good and we submit to him, we worship. That's worship, which is where Paul ends this section of the letter, Romans 11. And it's where I want to end this series. So I would invite you to stand with me as we worship. And if you're Ephraim West, stand up as well. And watching online, stand up where you're watching. Let's stand together and worship. I invite you to worship a God who keeps his promises. To worship a God who fulfills his plans for you and for his world. A God who invites you into his family through grace. And when we think about the incredible plan that God put in place to do that, we worship. So let's worship together using the words of Paul at the end of Romans 11. Let's say this together. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated.